Every life has its struggles. Not all of life is a struggle, hopefully, but every life has some struggle. And though it's not always fair or just or good, the truth is some lives face more struggle than others. And we're in, when we're in the midst of those struggles, all we want to do is to be able to snap our fingers and find ourselves on the other side of them. But as we know, it doesn't really work that way. No, in the end, oftentimes, the only way through our struggles is through them. Only as it turns out, the journey itself matters. In other words, how we manage to face our struggles as we're learning can help determine who we are on the other side of them. So maybe the question for us is who do we want to be on the other side of this? Jacob, as we heard in our scripture passage for today, struggled until he received a blessing from it. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Maybe, friends, we might manage to do the same. Fortunately for us, we don't struggle alone. And so today... On this day when we around the globe, each and every one of us individually and collectively face our struggles, some of us growing more weary than others, we pause together that we might face our struggles and in so doing begin together to find the blessing within them. Let's begin with our global struggles, of which there are plenty to choose from, but we would be remiss if we didn't Pay attention to the biggest one facing us right now, which, of course, is the global pandemic. It's hard to overstate just how much this has turned the world upside down in the last few months. We've watched a disease, a virus whose origin is still being debated, begin in a small part of the world and then find its way around the globe, infecting millions, killing, at last count, two-thirds of a million people, two thirds of a million people finding its way into almost every corner of the globe, leaving virtually no life unchanged. We've watched leaders struggle to respond with varying degrees of success, largely due to their ability to admit that there's a problem, but as we have seen in our own land, too often leaders have failed to do so, and as a result, this virus has continued to spread and people have continued to suffer. As so often happens, one disease reveals a deeper illness, and we have seen this pandemic laid bare the gross disparities that exist in our world, the injustices, the inequalities, the inadequacies of connection, of sharing, of health, of access of the fullness of life we have all come to long for and expect. This, by almost every measure, has been a hard few months. And as we're still smack dab in the middle of it, still on that journey through our struggle, unsure of when we're going to reach our destination, it seems kind of hard to find a blessing within this. We look around and think, seriously, we're try supposed to find something to appreciate in the midst of all this, but it's there, isn't there? It's got to be. We haven't gone through all of this for nothing, not that God is causing us to, this to teach us some kind of lesson. That's not the way we think it works. We don't believe that God is causing this. No, we believe that God gives us freedom to live in this world, which means that sometimes bad things happen even to good people. But that's different than saying that there's not a lesson to be learned in the midst of all of this. Surely there is. If nothing else, this pandemic has reminded us of just how connected we all are in this world. 
completely destroyed are those notions that we can completely isolate ourselves from one another, that we can wrap ourselves in our flags, build up our walls, and pretend like what we do doesn't affect our neighbors around us. Maybe the blessing in this is the blessing of connection. We Christians, of course, are supposed to know that, though if we're honest, we forget it more often than not. After all, we who are disciples of Jesus Christ, we who bear that cross, have to recognize something more than arbitrary human borders. To be a citizen of Christ necessarily means being a citizen of the world, of the whole world, of seeing each and every person as a neighbor. And friends, it's hard to love your neighbor through a wall. In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great family bound in love throughout the whole wide world earth. Maybe the blessing in this moment is recognizing that whether we see it or not, whether we act like it or not, whether we embrace it or not, we are each of us connected intimately to one another, that what I do affects you and what you do affects me, that we are in this together. Who do we want to be on the other side of this, friends? What would it look like if at the end of this pandemic we came out better than we were before? What would it look like if we saw each and every struggle not just as the struggle of certain individuals but as our struggle too? As Martin Luther King Jr. put it, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. What if we actually believed it? What if we led with our connection to one another? Of course, it might mean starting closer to home. We have struggles there, too, as we know. We've had struggles as a nation for, well, since the very beginning. We've known about them. As the former President Barack Obama put in his beautiful eulogy for the civil rights leader John Lewis this week, forming a more perfect union necessarily meant that our founders recognized we had room to grow. We Methodists, of course, understand that fairly intrinsically. That is a part of our faith. The founder of the Methodist movement believed that the Christian life was about moving ever onward toward perfection. Not perfection in terms of body or of mind, but in terms of heart. That the call of the Christian life for a Methodist or, frankly, anyone else is perfect love of God and neighbor, and until we reach that destination, we have room to grow. We as a nation have room to grow, don't we? We have our struggles. We've had them from the very beginning. It's why it's hard to find our way back to something that was great, because it's hard to picture when that actually was. From the original sin of slavery to its whitewashed grandchild of the prison industrial complex, we have our struggles. Pick your poison, friends, from inequality to our health care system to our education to income disparities to housing to anything else. We don't have to look very far to find our struggles, but perhaps the greatest struggle we're facing right now is our, in our inability to face them together. Look at the pandemic. Everyone in the world knows that there's a problem, but we here in the United States have made it into a partisan issue as if the virus gives two flips about how we voted in the last election. It doesn't care if our mascot is a donkey or a elephant. It affects all of us. Friends, not everything is binary. We can't break everything down into conservative and liberal. Sure, there are some things that are just right and wrong. We can name a few of them, but so often we need each other's help to suss them out. We need each other's help to figure it out, to find it out, to find the subtlety and the nuance of it. And when we fail to seek each other's help, when we fail to listen to one another, when we fail to work towards solving our problems together, we all suffer. We've experienced it lately, haven't we? 
We've been suffering. And that suffering has exposed all of those other wounds that we've allowed to fester for so, so long. Maybe the gift of this moment is in the time it has given us to change. In other words, maybe the blessing of this moment is a chance to recognize that things can't stay as they are. If the blessing of the global struggle is connection, maybe the blessing of our more local struggle, struggle is correction. Maybe this is giving us a chance to change. We can't keep doing what we've been doing. It wasn't working then, not for everyone. And it's not going to work after this. It's time to change. It's time for correction, to repent, to turn literally in another direction. That's what repent means. Which direction are we going to face? So many have said they can't believe that the murder of George Floyd or Ahmoud Arbery or Breonna Taylor has moved so many people to protest when so many black and brown people have been brutally murdered in the same way over the last few years. But it makes sense, doesn't it? When we're all on the highway, it's hard to see the landscape around us. But when we come up on that accident, we have no choice but to look around, to see what is around us, and to finally make sense of it. Now that we've seen it, friends, the question is, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to change? What is it that we are going to correct? How will we do it? The short answer is together. The long answer is one relationship at a time. But we give thanks for the fact that it is possible. As John Lewis reminded us in his beautiful, posthumously published op-ed, ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America. But it's going to take each and every one of us looking in the mirror and asking what we need to do to change. Which brings us to that final locus of our struggles. Sure, we all care about the global struggles and the national struggles and the local struggles and the denominational struggles and the neighborhood struggles and our family struggles and our friend circle struggles, but if we're really honest when pressed, the one we care about most is our own. And we all have our struggles, don't we? Some of us struggle with addiction or depression or anxiety or brevity or something else. We struggle with money, or health, or illness, or relationship, or something else. Name the struggle that you have. You know what it is. The point is, in other words, we all struggle mostly and first and foremost with ourselves. So maybe we ought to start there. There is example, of course. We look at the scripture passage for today. Jacob is struggling. But this tale is usually just told in isolation as we did this morning. We hear this story as if it's not part of a larger story. But friends, none of us are just one piece of a story. We are all, we are all better than our worst moment and probably worse than our best moment. We all have a longer story that we're a part of. Jacob, too, as those who've been participating in the Bicentennial Bible Challenge can attest. Jacob, at this point, was not a particularly good person. In fact, we might even say he was a bad person. He, in case you have forgotten, duped his brother 
into selling him his birthright for a mess of pottage. He tricked his father into giving him the blessing that was meant for his brother. He has isolated himself, alienated his family, pushed everybody away, and let's not even get into his relationship issues just in case you missed the first line. He had two wives and two maid servants, which gave him 11 children. So much for the biblical view of marriage. He has some issues. and. Through that point in his life, he had spent everything focused solely on himself, only caring about himself and his own well-being and the ability for him to get ahead. Maybe we know people like that, but it had finally, as it often does, caught up with him. His brother Esau was coming with an army. And he didn't know what was going to happen to him. And so he crosses over and he sends his family away and he finally spends a moment by himself. As we know, that can be a hard thing to take a hard look in the mirror. We always tell this story as if Jacob is wrestling with an angel, but maybe it was something different. It doesn't say angel, it just says a man. Maybe he was really wrestling with himself. We know that feeling, don't we? One of those dark nights of the soul. Maybe we've had one recently where we can't sleep, we toss and turn, worrying about something, we can't get it out of our head. What we're really worried about is ourselves. How are we going to face this? There's a fairness in that. We all experience it from time to time. Jacob wrestles all night, but he will not let go of it until he finds some blessing within it. And when he does, though he is still wounded, though he still has consequences from that struggle, he comes out a changed person. His name moves from Jacob to Israel, one who has struggled with God and neighbor and survived. Friends, maybe we can too. If the global blessing in this is one of connection and the more local blessing is one of correction, maybe the blessing for us as individuals in this moment is the gift of time. The question is, will we have the courage to make the changes we need? If we do, we just might find some grace in the midst of it. Jacob did. He comes away from that moment changed, and when he confronts his brother the next day, though his brother had every right to run right over him with his entire army, instead he embraces him and begins anew. In his willingness to change, Jacob found grace. Maybe we can too. Friends, we all struggle. Some of us more than others, and though we wish we could just snap our fingers and make them all go away, sometimes the only way through them is through them, only as it turns out, the way we go on that journey matters. It determines who we are on the other side. Fortunately, we get to make this journey together. And if we can stick together, if we can get into some of that good trouble, as John Lewis reminded us, then maybe we will make it so that there are less struggles for those who come after. Who do we want to be on the other side of this? Friends, the struggle is real, but by the grace of God, so are the blessings. Amen.